<laughs> it was around 20 years ago when I first walked through the doors of a UU congregation, but it was closer to 30 years ago when someone first suggested that I should. <laughs> a college friend had extended the invitation to me. We'd been talking about religion while riding in a bus on a college choir tour. I probably spoke of my uncertainties about the dogma of the Protestant traditions of my family and how I wasn't sure that I believed in God, at least not the God I'd become accustomed to hearing about, which at that time of my life was the only God I knew. My friend listened to my views and told me that I sounded like a Unitarian and that I should check it out sometime. I didn't know what being a Unitarian meant, and I wasn't sure that I cared, but I held his invitation in my memory just in case it might come in handy someday. Several years later, when I was in my late 20s, I was in a time of transition in my life. I did not yet have a career direction that felt like a good fit. My fiance, Susan, and I were talking about leaving Chicago, where we had both been actors, and the other assorted jobs that enabled us to be actors. We were thinking about moving to New York City, where we figured Susan would earn her actor's, actor's equity card. But I was unsure about it all. I, had quit acting by then, and though I didn't see a future in my job teaching composition at Chicago State University, I was equally unclear of what I would pursue were we to move. I wanted to trust that in following Susan's path, something meaningful might be waiting for me too. But how would I know for sure? This was the mid-90s when the economy was robust enough that two 20-something white Midwesterners could move to New York City without jobs and, with some luck, land on their feet. So our timing was good, and beyond some good friendships, we weren't really tied to Chicago in any meaningful way. But the most important factor that led to our decision to move may have been the fact that I had been reading a popular New Age book at the time called The Celestine Prophecy. Some of you know this book. The book was an extended parable of a man's spiritual quest, with most of the plot twists being driven by the protagonist's acceptance that every person he met along his way would have something to offer him, something he needed to know, something that could aid him in the unfolding adventure of his life. I was inspired by this book's message that there could be valuable information and meaning in every encounter, and so I attempted to live its wisdom. As Susan and I mulled over the idea of moving to New York, I strove to take no encounter for granted. I struck up conversations with anyone, anywhere, searching for the wisdom and information that could be waiting for me. I began to see my life as one big invitation to connect and to learn, and sure enough, the more I talk to people with the intention to listen and to learn, the more people seem to tell me the very things I needed to know. These conversations led me to accept the opportunity to move to New York with an open heart and to even convince Susan that we should follow through when she got cold feet. And once we made the decision to move, these conversations led us to be able to find an apartment to find jobs, and as it turns out, to find a direction for my life, a direction that led me to my call to ministry, and in turn, to you. Looking back, I am clear that this was one of the most spiritually engaged times of my life, a magical time, a time of assuming that messages and invitations were, in fact, present everywhere, and that all I needed to find the meaningful was to open myself to the possible. Within a few weeks of moving to New York, I secured, through a friend of a friend, a job as a proofreader in the advertising and promotion department at Warner Books. I spent my days in a small office in the Time Life building across from Rockefeller Center, proofing ads and order forms for Warner Books titles. Given my willingness to be led by meaningful encounters and coincidence at the time, you can probably imagine my double take and my delight when an ad crossed my desk for the paperback version of the book that in some ways had led me to be there in the first place, The Celestine Prophecy. 
I proofed an ad for the Celestine Prophecy. Weird. Around this time, the New York City Transportation Authority had been posting placards of poetry in subway cars. One poem by Muriel Ruckheiser regularly caught my eye. Perhaps you've seen it in my office. It's a poem that seemed to capture the spirit with which I was now approaching the world and the invitations that it offered, a poem entitled, Yes. The closing lines became a kind of mantra for me in the adventure that had become my life. They read, open your eyes, dream but don't guess, your biggest surprise comes after yes. The more I said yes to the invitations I believed the world was offering, the more invitations seemed to surface. I had to be willing to open my eyes to those around me. I had to risk extending beyond my comfort zone in considering new possibilities and in making new connections. And I had to be willing to be surprised. Some days I was better at this than others. But I never regretted the moments when I mustered the courage to be open to the potential of meaningful connection, especially when I finally acted on my college friend's advice and visited a UU congregation for the first time, finding a path in that church that I have continued to walk ever since. In that congregation, the Community Church of New York, I gave myself to the possibility of encounter. I took the risk to know and to be known I attended new member classes and other small group opportunities. I volunteered in the church's homeless shelter. I taught in the religious education program for children, and I faithfully attended services, finding that there was always something, something in the sermon or the readings or the hymns or the silence or the conversations that followed that encouraged me to open my heart to say yes to my life. At the heart of this yes was the acceptance I found in that church, the understanding that my fellow church members and I may each have different views about the holy, but that we could still find meaning in walking together in and through our differences, and that to walk together in this way with our UU principles as a guide was to travel a truly spiritual path. The path could be challenging at times, no doubt, in conversations and small group meetings, people would sometimes share perspectives and understandings that did not match my own. And yet, I was encouraged to hear the truth in their experiences for them and to use that truth as a means through which I could consider my own evolving truth. In these conversations, I learned we were not actually gathering to argue or debate as much as we were gathering to share and to seek to understand. We were gathering to inhabit our own sense of the holy and to encourage our companions through our generous listening and curiosity to do the same. Now, I'm probably idealizing what I found in that first UU church a bit. There must have been times when members of that congregation stepped on each other's spiritual toes, when space was not left for difference despite our best intentions. This was a human community, after all. And we humans are complicated creatures who betray the calling of our better selves much of the time. At least I do. Still, the overarching message of the congregation and its UU faith was clear, even when we missed the mark. We are here to learn from each other, to open ourselves to the holy as we perceive it, and to grow our souls in community. To be, as we say in this church, open to life, expecting to love, and prepared to serve. Through my almost 20 years as a Unitarian Universalist, the invitations have not stopped, of course, and I expect they never will, if I am living faithfully, because at its best, ours is an invitational faith, a faith rooted in leaving space for difference. Ours is a faith that values freedom while encouraging community and honoring interdependence. Ours is a faith that invites the evolution of our thinking and the creative interchange that can bring about that evolution. Ours is an invitational faith. I'm going to tell you about a few unexpected car rides and conversations I've had this month that have reminded me of the power of meaningful connection 
and the invitational focus of my faith. The first story began when I was picked up at my home by an employee from a local rental car company. I needed to check out a car to drive for a few days while I shopped for another vehicle to replace the one that was totaled in the accident a few weeks ago. Within a block of riding with this fellow, I'll call him Kevin, I had revealed that I was a minister. I'm not sure how or why that happened, but it did. I didn't say which church I served, and he didn't ask. Instead, he said, you're a pastor? I'm going to offer you my testimony. <laughs> okay, I said, even as I thought, uh-oh. Now, I don't like, I don't like that I thought, uh-oh, but I did. I wasn't really carrying an invitational spirit into that encounter. <laughs> I wasn't really open to a meaningful connection, at least not yet. For the duration of the 15-minute trip, Kevin told me some of the challenges he had faced in his adult life. He told me how he had been addicted to cocaine, how he'd made bad choices, how he'd hurt people. He told me of how one day when his life had really unraveled for him, and he was at his lowest point, he saw a vision of Jesus, felt the presence of Jesus, felt the love that was being extended to him from Jesus, and he knew he had to change his heart. He had to get straight. As he spoke, my faith didn't ask me to question his experience of the holy. My faith asked me to listen to him, to try to see the world through his eyes, to seek to understand his humanity, to journey for a time with him with the expectation that we could both learn something from this encounter. And so I opened my heart to him. I valued his vulnerability and his willingness to share with me. I honored his story with my attention. I chose to be an invitational presence. Wow, that's a powerful story, I said. He told me of how he had turned his life over to Jesus that day and how he believes he has a responsibility to share his story. He said, if Jesus could come to me in my time of need, the least I can do is to tell other people about him. As we pulled into the parking lot of the rental car office, I thanked him for taking the risk to tell me about his life, and I wished him the best. For the next few days, I couldn't get him out of my mind. But it wasn't just his story that stuck with me. It was his willingness to share his truth with me without demanding that I respond. He hadn't tried to convince me of anything. He had just told me his story and how his heart had been changed because he thought I might find it useful and because he has learned that sharing his story has been useful for him. He offered me an example of how heartfelt testimony can be an expression of an invitational faith, an example that I would soon follow myself. You see, a few days later, I was traveling and chatting with a stranger again, this time while I was tr test driving a used car. The salesman, I'll call him Dan, broke a moment of silence as we traveled the roads near the dealership to tell me about a challenge in his life. Mark, he said, my son doesn't believe in God. You're a pastor. <laughs> what advice would you offer me to help him understand that God is real? Hmm, I said, even as I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> so I stalled a bit, saying, hmm. I'm not sure I'm going to be much help to you, given that I serve a church with a generous num number of people who don't believe in God. He gave me a puzzled look, and I realized it was time to testify for my faith. For my faith. I said, do you know much about Unitarian Universalism? He didn't. And so I spoke of how we do not share a creed, how what we believe about God is less important than how we choose to be with one another, how we give of ourselves to bring about a more just and peaceful world. I spoke of our principles and the ethical core they provide us. 
And I spoke of how I never thought I'd be a minister, but that I had found a faith that really works for me. He had a lot of questions, and I did my best to answer. Do you use the Bible? Sometimes, but not more than any other religious text, and not as often as we use other poetry or prose or even personal narrative. Do you have weddings and funerals? Yes, some say these rituals are our most powerful ministries because we focus on the people involved and leave space for different theological perspectives. Do you baptize children? Mm, we dedicate children. We acknowledge their chosen names and promise our commitment to them and their parents as a faith community. Do you believe in heaven? Well, we don't have agreement on that. We tend to focus more on this life than on any life that may follow. And I spoke of how we are bound together in covenant, in the promise to walk together despite our differences, and that we find great meaning in this commitment to one another, in this conviction that, as one of our forebears said, we need not think alike to love alike. I told him if he wanted to know more, he could visit our website where he could learn about our congregation's nearly 140-year history in Des Moines and where many of my sermons are posted. We were nearing the car dealership when I switched from just answering questions to true testimony, to testifying to the power of my faith in my life. I said, Unitarian Universalism isn't for everyone. It can be a challenging religion because it invites us to never stop learning from one another even when we disagree, even when we are led to question things we have never before questioned. But it has certainly been a spiritual home for me. I told him, my UU faith helps me be a more relational and generous person and a more active citizen. It challenges me when I'm most self-righteous and comforts me when I'm most despairing. It encourages me to celebrate the beauty and the possibility of life even as it asks me to see injustice and to help undo that injustice. It invites me to be the best I can be and to contribute toward bringing about a world where others can do the same. And for all that it has added to my life, I said, I am grateful. As we pulled into the lot, I was proud of myself for testifying, for the invitation I hoped my testimony had offered Dan to see that he needn't worry over his son's struggles with God, and that the power and possibility of his son's faith or lack of faith isn't in his hands anyway. As we said our goodbyes, he thanked me and asked for my card. I called him later that night to ask a question about one of the cars I drove, and he said, I watched one of your sermons, Mark. <laughs> I didn't ask him which one or even what he thought. I was just pleased that he felt invited to learn more. For ours, at its best, is an invitational faith. A few days later, I returned to the rental car office and asked for a ride home. Kevin emerged from the back to again be my driver. He greeted me with a smile. You're the pastor, right? As he drove me home, I asked him about his work, and he told me about another job he holds at a company that I know is a partner of Project Iowa, the workforce development effort initiated by Amos. I told him how Project Iowa helps people who are underemployed find living wage careers, how we have graduated and helped place around 200 Iowans over the past few years, many of whom were unable to find work due to criminal records or bad choices in their past, and how helping to put this program together had been a great joy for me and a powerful expression of my faith in human resilience and possibility. He then told me about his son, who he thought might benefit from the program, how his son had a drug arrest on his record from a few years ago that was holding him back. I invited him to get his son involved, knowing that in this invitation that was emerging from our meaningful encounter, a life could change for the better. And I was reminded yet again what my invitational faith is really all about, the possibility of change for the better. Every day, we engage with folks who might appreciate knowing more about our faith, especially if we were to testify to why it matters to us, how it brings us comfort, challenge, and hope in ways that improve our lives. Our success in offering our testimony will not be determined by their attendance at our church or even by their agreement with us. 
Our success will be determined by the degree to which we have offered them space where understanding and compassion may grow. At least that's how I gauge the success of my invitational faith. How about you? Life offers us countless invitations to meaningful connections. And these invitations are always before us. But to find the meaningful, we have to open ourselves to the possible, to accept the invitation that may be waiting for us. Before we conclude today, I want to offer invitations that have been crafted with you and with this faith that we share in mind. We've got ushers that are going to pass out baskets, and in these baskets are invitations. I invite you to take one, take one, when the basket comes to you. I invite you to open it and reflect on its message. Is this an invitation you need to accept right now? And as others open their invitations, I invite you to meditate on how you might receive this invitation before you. How might you say yes to the life it is offering? And once everyone's received their invitation, I'll offer a closing blessing. Let the invitations now be offered and received. Is the camera still rolling, Rob? Good. Uh, For those of you that are watching this on YouTube, I'm going to open your invitation for you. You're invited to... Come to church next Sunday. (laughs) There's still a few invitations being passed. As you take this invitation with you, What would it be like to assume that it was meant just for you? Just for you. Most of you have different invitations, believe it or not. So you can talk about them after the service. Might give you a good conversation starter. An opportunity for a meaningful encounter. May you find yourself open to the invitation you have received and to all the invitations before you in the days to come. Invitations to know and to be known. Invitations to discover your biggest surprise that comes after yes. Invitations to live your faith toward the possibility of change for the better. May it be so. Amen.